Hello, I'm Michael O'Brien. In this podcast, we are going to talk about criminal law and the widely held rule that the cheese stands alone, the implications of that rule, and some thoughts on the future and how it may be interpreted. In general, in crimes, to find someone criminally liable, there needs to be a bad act sometimes called an actus reus, a bad mind, sometimes called mens rea. And in some crimes, the bad act must cause some prohibited result. And so what is it that signifies a bad act from just any other act? Well, the most obvious example is affirmative conduct. For instance, if you're lying about whether or not there's a development on property in order to get people to invest in that property, thinking that it's developed, but it's really not developed, and just trying to take their money, that affirmative conduct is a bad act. In the business context for omissions, the most commonly found one is contracts. In Commonwealth versus Pestinkius, there was a contract to provide care to an elderly person in the form of food and clothing and and some medical care, none of which was provided. The elderly person died. The Commonwealth accused the care providers of murder. Their convictions were upheld. Now, it's not always stealing and murdering people that the government is trying to prohibit. There's about 3,000 federal crimes today, but they're defined in very, very nuanced ways that cover a wide swath of conduct. In United States versus Kernell, Mr. Kernell hacked into Sarah Palin's email and then later cleared his browser history. Uh, He was convicted of obstruction of justice for violating a a portion of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 that prohibited destroying or tampering with material that you may have reason to believe is evidence of a crime. So clearing your browsing history. Holly versus State dealt with a young man who was 18 and he went to sleep one night. His friends came over and he thought they were drinking. They told him that they wanted to go and and kill a young woman and rob her, and they wanted to borrow his car in order to do this. He laughed. He thought that it was ridiculous and thought that they just needed to get his car to the liquor store before the liquor store closed at midnight. He loaned them their car. They, in fact, killed the woman, and he was convicted of murder. He's serving life without parole in Florida. Causation is not in every crime. It's not a requirement. But some crimes do require it because the state, for whatever reason, wants to limit the number of people that can be convicted. There's a couple of common ways that we see causation applied. The first is factual causation. If a particular result is required and doesn't happen, then the crime fails. State versus Brillo is an example. In this case, A series of police officers chased two people who were in a car, and upon getting the car to stop, they fired a rather large number of bullets into the car uh, on the order of several hundred. Mr. Brello, standing on the hood, fired 24 bullets into a young woman that was sitting in the passenger seat. She was unarmed. Other people fired as well. One of Brello's bullets Uh, combined with at least two other bullets resulted in uh, this young woman's death. The court found Mr. Brello not guilty as he did not fire the requisite number of fatally causing bullets in order to kill the young woman. He fired many bullets into her and as it turned out maybe he wasn't a terribly great shot. He was only a few feet away and uh, 
he wasn't able to kill her with the bullets that he fired. Sometimes we see negligence variety crimes that require foreseeability, and it essentially means that you recognize that it's likely that what you're doing is going to have some specified bad result. You're driving very fast on an icy bridge, and you unsurprisingly smash into somebody. Where causation is required for a crime, an intervening cause can terminate this foreseeability. This could be a situation where you're driving out of control on a bridge, but uh, before you end up crashing into somebody else, the car explodes in an engine fire. And it turns out the engine fire ends up causing the damage. You would not face liability for the damage that was caused by the engine fire. The last part of many crimes is the mental state. And there's a bunch of different ways that there's that mental states can be found in crimes. There's some 73 in the 300 crimes in, in the federal system. But typically we see specific intent. There's a bunch of different kinds of specific intent, but it's where you do something and you want some particular result to occur. I'm taking your thing because I want your thing. That would be an example of specific intent. General intent is where you do something, but you don't really know or don't particularly care what's going to happen next. I'm swinging my arms, and they happen to hit you. That's still battery. You had the general intent of swinging your arms, and even if you didn't know they were going to hit me, you knew you were swinging them, and that's intent enough. And finally, the one that's made the biggest leap in the last... 60 or so years has been strict liability. This is where no particular intent is required. Simply having completed the act is all that's necessary for criminal liability. The government, when passing the statute, can assign whatever mental state that it wants. There's no presumption of strict liability. That has to be affirmatively stated. But if it's not affirmatively stated, then the courts will read in a mental state if one isn't specified. So let's put this together. In, uh, shortly after World War II, Mr. Dodderwick was charged with selling misbranded or adulterated drugs. And he didn't personally sell them. He was the CEO of a company who um, he hired a person who hired a person who hired several other people who hired somebody that ended up selling the drugs. Mr. Dodderwick had no idea what was going on. The Supreme Court said that this was a violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act because he had a reasonable relation to the shipment. That is, he knew the shipment happened. He didn't know that it was of a misbranded or adulterated drug, but that didn't matter. He knew of the shipment, and that was knowledge enough. So uh, what happens if he didn't know of the shipment? And those were the facts of United States versus Park. Mr. Park uh, was CEO of Acme Foods. His office was in Philadelphia, and he had a four warehouses around the country, one of which was in Baltimore. And the Baltimore um, had some adulterated cheese that was caused by rats. So uh, the facts of Park are very much like the children's nursery rhyme, The Farmer and the Dell. So you may recall in The Farmer and the Dell, the farmer brings his wife, the wife brings her son, the son brings a dog, the dog brings the cat, the cat brings the mouse, the mouse brings the cheese, and the cheese stands alone. Is the cheese standing alone? The presence of adulterated food, even if Park did everything he could to prevent it, is it adequate for criminal liability? The Supreme Court unanimously answered the question, yes. That is, the cheese stands alone, stands for the premise that the fact that something bad happened can allow extremely tangential criminal liability, if that's what it is that Congress wanted to do. This provides an extremely broad swath of activity, as we noted earlier, that's very banal, that can result 
in criminal liability. So what's the solution? In Daughter Wick, Felix Frankfurter wrote that we need to trust the conscious and circumspection of prosecuting officers. That is, we just need to trust that prosecutors are going to make good decisions, and even though they could throw anyone in jail pretty much any day they wanted to, they just won't, because they're conscious and circumspect. Practical experience has indicated this isn't the case. Krovitz, in an article in the Wall Street Journal and a subsequent book by the same title, You Commit Three Felonies a Day, points out the huge breadth of conduct prohibited under the criminal law and the strong likelihood that, it, that you have managed to commit such a crime in the time that you've listened to this podcast. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to speaking with you in the future.